I hear all the time being bellowed from the rooftops by the anti-creationists is that creationists don't publish in peer-reviewed scientific journals. The implied criticism, of course, being that if it's not published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal, then it is not science. The irony here is that the vast majority of people making this claim have never published anything in any peer-reviewed journal. in the mirror lately? Are you ever black? Most people who have published papers in peer-reviewed journals know better than to make such an ignorant statement. Well, just what is peer review? According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a process by which a scholarly work, such as a paper or a research proposal, is checked by a group of experts in the same field to make sure it meets the necessary standards before it is published or accepted. When Bill Nye agreed to debate Ken Ham, the Richard Dawkins Foundation posted a scathing blog against Nye, trying to dissuade him from debating. The author wrote, Evolution is a scientific fact, backed by mountains of evidence, peer-reviewed papers you can stack to the moon, and an incredible scientific community consensus. Creationism is a debunked mythology that is based solely on faith. It has zero peer-reviewed papers to back up its claims, it has absolutely no scientific consensus, and is not even considered science due to the fact that it cannot be tested. <laughs> Such remarks can only be described as libenter ignoramus. And don't get me started on consensus of opinion. See Creevorant number 51 for my take on that. So, does publishing in a peer-reviewed science journal make your research science? Does not publishing in a scientific journal automatically disqualify your research from being considered scientific? Well, of course not. One of the reasons you will seldom hear an actual published scientist make this charge is because of experience with the process of peer review. Any published author will tell you horror stories of referees making ridiculous and nasty criticisms and rejecting a paper on absurd grounds. In fact, multiple scientific works have been rejected by peer-reviewed journals only for the researchers to carry on and win the Nobel Prize. Juan Miguel Campanario compiled a list of dozens and dozens of researchers who had their papers rejected by peer-reviewed science journals only to earn a Nobel Prize for their research. And we're not talking about obscure discoveries either. In 1960, Frank McFarlane Burnett had his paper concerning antibody response rejected by a British journal. He then did the unthinkable and published his work in a non-peer-reviewed monograph. He wound up winning the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. David Morris Lee, Douglas Osheroff, and Robert Coleman Richardson discovered superfluid helium. Their paper on the discovery was rejected by physical review letters. One of the referees argued that the system cannot do what the authors are suggesting it does. Well, the Nobel Committee disagreed and awarded the team the 1996 Nobel Prize in Physics. Oh, and let us not forget Hans Adolf Krebs, the discoverer of the biochemical process that now bears his name. You probably learned about the Krebs cycle in high school biology or college. His paper on the discovery was rejected by nature. Yet that discovery earned him the 1953 Nobel Prize and made his name an icon in biology. After winning the Nobel Prize, Krebs said afterwards, Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the Nobel Committee for this great honor. And to the referees who rejected my paper, I have only one thing to say. Neener, 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 neener. That may not be a direct quote. Nevertheless, Gunther Blobel won the 1999 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine and spoke about the problems of peer review in his press conference after receiving the prize. He said the main problem one encounters in one's research is, quote, 
when your grants and papers are rejected because some stupid reviewer rejected them for dogmatic adherence to old ideas. This drew thunderous applause from the audience. Well, surely editors and peer review referees wouldn't be adhering to old ideas, you know, like evolution. Now, would they? In the meantime, peer-reviewed journals and conferences regularly get burned and embarrassed publishing fraudulent research papers that the reviewers never caught. In fact, multiple individuals have submitted nonsense papers to journals specifically to test the peer review process and had their papers accepted and even published. Douglas Peters and Stephen Sisi conducted a highly controversial and effective study. They took 12 articles published in peer-reviewed journals, slapped different author names and affiliations onto the papers, and then resubmitted the papers to the very same journals which vetted and published them. Of the 38 editors and reviewers, only three detected the papers as resubmissions, and eight out of nine remaining papers were rejected by the reviewers. These papers had all passed peer review by the very same people only 18 to 32 months prior. <laughs> Meanwhile, major peer reviewed journals have admitted in print that they will not publish creationist or intelligent design papers. So, how is it then that censorship? somehow proves creation science is unscientific. Hey, you there! Aren't you one of the referees who rejected my paper from peer review? C -c come here! I have an experiment I want to conduct on your skull. I want to see if my Nobel Prize is really made out of metal or not. Also, some of the most significant works never went through peer review, like Crick and Watson's work on the double helix structure of the DNA. Probably the most famous scientific statement was made by Einstein in his theory of relativity, E equals MC squared. Mm -hmm. While published in a peer-reviewed journal, his work did not go through peer review. And of course, the very people who are demanding that creationists publish in a secular peer-reviewed journal are adherents to Darwinism, a theory penned by a theologian, Charles Darwin who never published his theory in a peer-reviewed journal. <laughs> well, wait a minute. We have a word for a person who is obstinately or intolerantly devoted to his or her own opinions and prejudices, especially one who regards or treats members of a group as a racial or ethnic group with hatred and intolerance. They are called a bigot. Yet in spite of all this, and contrary to what the Libenter Ignoramus bigots claim, creationists HAVE published in peer-reviewed journals. What's peer-reviewed? A process by which a scholarly work, such as a paper or research proposal, is checked by a group of experts in the same field to make sure it meets the necessary standards before it is published or accepted. Because of the open, flagrant bigotry, Creationists published their own peer-reviewed journals where at least the qualified reviewers were not hostile towards research that challenges the status quo and dogma of evolutionism. Contrary to the bigots who would like to say otherwise, these are peer-reviewed science journals by very definition. In fact, multiple researchers who moved from publishing in secular journals to publishing in the creationist journals have remarked how they found the peer review was as good and often better than the secular journals. The Creation Research Society Quarterly is a peer reviewed journal now in print for 50 years with almost 200 issues and 3,000 pages of peer reviewed research. And of course, the majority of those papers contain research and information you will not find anywhere else. The Creation Ex Nihilo Technical Journal, now called the Journal of Creation, is another peer-reviewed science journal that has been publishing since 1984. A new online journal called the Answers Research Journal was started in January 2008 and has also been a steady flow of provocative, leading-edge research. Yes, it is peer-reviewed. 
I've been both a technical reviewer and have had my work peer reviewed in these circles. I can attest to the quality of the peer review process within the creationist journals. But aside from this, again, contrary to what the bigots would have you to believe, creationists have published, even in secular peer reviewed journals. Dr. Robert Gentry has published dozens of papers, mostly focused on radio halos, challenging the conventional interpretations of deep time and an ancient earth. His papers were published in Science, Nature, Geophysical Research Letters, to name but a few. Professor of Thermodynamics at University of Leeds, Dr. Andrew McIntosh, published papers in multiple journals challenging conventional evolutionary theory. One paper entitled, Information and Entropy, Top-Down or Bottom-Up Development in Living Systems, was published in the International Journal of Design and Nature and Ecodynamics. The editors bravely published it in spite of the challenges to traditional evolutionary dogma. Macintosh pointed out the thermodynamic challenges to evolution and the rise of information and pointed to the need for a designer, a creator. Dr. Robert A. Herman has published, without co-authors, 73 articles in 30 different journals from 14 countries. He has written over 250 published reviews as well as 7 books, 5 of which are available free of charge from his internet site or the archive.org. He has personally presented 31 papers at scientific conferences and over 1,200 scientific disclosures. Of the 300,000 individuals who have produced approximately 1.6 million published papers or books in the mathematical sciences and for whom there is sufficient data in the MR archives, Dr. Herman ranks in the top 2% in the production of such material. Of those 73 publications, 57 appear in non-theologically related peer-reviewed scientific journals. Of the 57, 15 have direct application to his general intelligent design model or the origins of our universe. Dr. Herman's general intelligent design model is not the same as the familiar intelligent design theory promoted by the Discovery Institute. Yet be sure that Dr. Herman's model most certainly points to the necessity of a creator for our universe and life. Now he points to Jesus Christ, as do I. If there is a creator, and that is what the scientific evidence published in peer-reviewed journals shows, then one must ask, what does that creator want from me? We have all sinned or rebelled against our creator, doing what we knew was wrong anyway. Now that disobedience has completely messed up this creation, bringing sickness, disease, and even death to this creation. Because this creation has been corrupted, he says he is going to make a new earth and a new heaven. But he then cannot allow even one drop of sin into that new heaven and new earth, or else it too will become corrupted. So what to do? Because we have all sinned and the price of sin is death, our Creator Himself came up with the solution. He would die for us. He created a body to live in as one of us, going by the name of Jesus Christ, who after living a sinless life, paid the price for us sinners, so we might inherit eternal life. But he said, you must be born again. Now, that simply means believing on him and that he died for you, asking him to forgive you of your sins and he will give you eternal life. That's the testimony that's been found by many peer reviewers of the Bible for thousands of years. Bam, 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 bam.